And so we began by watching Unka's big mucka, and then we read the chapter today on political organization. And I think I'd like to start out with the question of you know, why why do, why do we study politics and anthropology? A lot of people come into an anthropology class and are expecting to study, you know, faraway groups in Papua New Guinea like Unka, but the question of why you'd be studying politics seems seems strange. And what I want to do is take this back to a, a sort of a, an older and much deeper philosophical concern, especially uh, uh, in in European societies. And as European societies started to interact with uh, people, especially in the Americas. And the uh, one of the deep ideas about why we need political controls is is comes to us from the philosopher Thomas Hobbes and Hobbes wrote in Latin and old English that life in a state of nature would be the war of all against all everybody's fighting each other and so the idea was that if life in a state of nature was every man for himself or the law of the jungle or the war of all against all, then you needed something to control the, the natural instincts of people. And so for Hobbes, it was the state or the social contract or his, in his book, The Leviathan, which was going to pacify the instincts, the natural instincts of everybody to fight each other. And it's interesting in, in kind of what we might call Western thought is that we decided that in the field of economics and business, that it was okay to have basically pretty much unfettered competition. You can try to get as, be completely out for yourself and famously, we rely on Adam Smith that the market's going to work everything out for us if everybody just follows their follows their desires to make as much money as possible within limits, within the limits of the law, of course. But in politics, it was believed that if we didn't somehow curtail this, that everybody would just be fighting each other. And although these these ideas might seem like they come to us from a long way away, they in fact are still part of our assumptions and debates today when we think about uh, the role of the police, for example. And will, people, will people naturally just be fighting each other and stealing from each other if we don't have the police around to, to clamp down on these, what we would consider to be the natural instincts or the war of all against all, everyone against everyone. So what this led to is an assumption that if your institutions looked kind of like that, that then you could have government and law and political uh, control or political order. And that if your institute people looked kind of like that, that you probably were in some sort of state of nature in which you needed to be controlled. So we called uh, what uh, Michael Gonzalez and Camp call uncentralized societies were called stateless societies. So that they were lacking in government or didn't have it yet or had it, but in a bad way, in a strange way. And in some ways we still see that. I don't know if we have an idealism still among us about that we're going to go spread democracy to other places. Uh, we probably have to make sure we have democracy in our own place first. But uh, in the old days, at least, uh, we used to think of ourselves as going to other countries and helping them establish and spread democracy into, uh, into faraway lands, even if we had to impose it upon them. So... Again, this is a, a deep concern in uh, 
in what you might call Western or European American societies about how how do people organize? How do, should they be governed? Now, when it comes to the question of how people organize, what anthropologists discovered when they went into these places is that people were able to organize in a kind of amazing ways. And uh, we, one of the way, one of the things that was kind of a puzzle to people is that if the people that were being colonized didn't have a state or a government, how come, how are they able to resist colonial rule? How are they able to not, to, to sort of form, uh, form resistance and, and armies against what was being imposed if they were not able to organize a state government. And of course, we might look at Unka's Big Mugga as a, you know, an amazing feat of political and economic organization that seems to happen completely outside of any state or government context. Now, one of the things that anthropologists turn to as a way to explain how people could organize outside of the realm of the state is the idea of kinship, that people organize according to uh, systems of lineage and family relationships. And we will be talking about that on in Monday's class. Um, and that's why in, in some sometimes I actually do try to read the marriage, family, gender, sexuality chapter first before political organization, which is how it was ordered. But in this case, I thought it was better to flip it. But the general idea is that, that by extending the principles of lineage, lineage and descent, uh, not necessarily biological, but kind of socially, you can call people together for things like resisting uh, colonial rule. And in general, that what anthropologists discovered is that there's a, a number of different things that are that are hard to see from the outside that you wouldn't necessarily see as a court system or a legal system. They're, they're not there's not buildings in which these things take place necessarily, but they function in a way to uh, to keep the peace as the mukka is said to do, uh, or to uh, resolve disputes, um, that these things can, can function in our, in our society. So when it comes to anthropology, we, anthropology likes to think of itself, going back to that term as, as holistic, as meaning we try to understand politics as interconnected to other areas of life so that our political system is interconnected with our economics, religion, other ideas, and our, our kinship and lineage ideas as well. So anthropology in general has challenged this idea that in other societies they simply lack a government or an absence of law, or there's no such thing as a or an absence of, of court norms. Although anthropology has pointed to the ways in which kinship and gender are used to organize societies. Uh, in outside of government, uh, anthropologists have also insisted that kinship and gender remain politically relevant in state societies and contemporary societies as well. And uh, the idea that th those things have simply disappeared from, from politics and we now do politics as a meritocracy, again, something that probably nobody, nobody, 
believes now, but there were these ideas that somehow in, in modern political systems, considerations of kinship and gender uh, tended to disappear. Obviously, we know that's not true now. And most importantly for what we're going to be talking about, uh, anthropology, I believe, has helped to provide tools for looking at different kinds of political organizations or ways of talking about uh, the way in which we organize ourselves according to uh, what we might call politics. One of the, I think, most interesting distinctions uh, and this is Muckle, Gonzalez, and Camp start talking about this on page 304, is the distinction between having persuasive power and coercive power. And this comes up a lot in, in Onka, and so it's a good lead into that. Uh, as they keep saying, Onka isn't able to enforce the things that he's talking about. He may be a big man, but what he has is, or what he tries to do is persuade people to follow what he's what what he's wanting them to do. He does not have the kind of power that uh, that we associate with, for example, the police or being able to make someone uh, do what. Uh, you want in society. And this is parallel to something that I'd like to talk about that Muckle Gonzalez and Camp don't really uh, mention, a distinction that other uh, anthropologists uh, drawing on the work of a, a, an Italian theorist, uh, Antonio Gramsci, uh, distinguishes between hegemony and domination. And for many people outside of the social sciences, these are kind of synonyms that domination and is, is basically the same as hegemony. Uh, they'd be seen as this, as, as this, the same, just maybe hegemony is less uh, a less familiar word. But what Gramsci and others tried to do was to think about how domination corresponds to ways in which the people in charge are basically imposing their will, uh, basically through coercive mechanisms. But if you have hegemony, you have a system in which people are also, from the bottom, you might say, believing in that. So we'll talk about this later when it comes to ideas of social stratification. To what extent do the people uh, who are being dominated believe in and accept the overall system? So if, if you have acceptance of that system, then you would call that hegemony. But there are some cases when people don't buy what's going on. They're still dominated, but they completely disagree with what's, uh, what's happening. So we'll talk about that a little bit. I just I don't want to signal these parallel or uh, these, these ways in which we can think about power, uh, one being persuasive power, which is what we saw with Unka, the other being coercive power and corresponding to ideas of hegemony and domination. So that helps us then talk about the ways in which people use social controls. So what can Gonzalez and Camp talk about power, authority, and prestige? And in some ways, these kind of blend into each other. They separate out a little bit the idea that sometimes we give someone authority to do things, to have power, and in other cases, they have power conferred upon them. Um, and there are, are certainly people who try to earn power through prestige. And of course, that's where, again, Anka comes in with the idea of the big man 
who affirms his status with great shows of generosity. So as Anka says at the very end, I, I have won, I have knocked you down by giving so much. And so it's a kind of a very different idea than, than we have perhaps in our own society where we make great shows of accumulating things. Um, in this case, it is a, a great show of generosity, which is able to affirm your status. We also have what are called internalized controls. You might say these are those kinds of things in which people are internally persuaded to mostly do the right thing without having to necessarily make them do it. So Cass, you talked about a couple of internalized controls. What are those? Shame and guilt. Yeah, guilt and shame. So these are things that, so in, I guess maybe, Uncle Gonzales and Camp try to tell us that we are probably, in our society, we're more into the guilt idea. Uh, which is that, you know, we feel we have these ideas that if we do something wrong, uh, that we are, that, that we feel guilty about it. And so uh, they say that is more like what happens in a, um, in what we talked about as an independence training society in which uh, notions are affixed to the individual and individual actions. Whereas uh, shame is, uh, I say, say shame cultures is in which you're, you are very conscious of the criticism of others, especially those of higher social status. And so uh, some people say that for, uh, that this would correspond to people who are in dependence training cultures or those that are more aware of their social obligations. Um, and there are, uh, I think that in some ways you could say that this corresponds to whole societies. Uh, my wife was reminding me that uh, in Korean society, if you are, if you make a mistake, you are supposed to uh, kind of bow before the whole country. And, and it, that's part of what you are what, what you are supposed to do when you do something wrong. Um, so these things are, are they, we call them internalized controls because they're the, they're the social norms, but they become internalized. They seem very natural to us. And then people do things that are according to the guidelines of society without, uh, without having to be, uh, to be sanctioned or to, to have a, an external control, we'll talk about in a second. Cass, you asked if we if, if we would be classified as more guilt or more shame, and I guess my answer to that is what Michael Gonzalez and Camp say here. I think I might have told them to say this. Both guilt and shame operate to some extent in most societies. So there's always going to be that mix of that. Uh, which one is prioritized at different times and in different peoples and perhaps according to your different religious experiences uh, growing up uh, will come into view. Uh, but I think both of those operate to a certain extent, as they say, in all societies. We also have what they call externalized controls or sanctions, rules imposed from the outside. So there's sanctions that are the punishments that result from breaking rules. So if guilt and shame are things that we, we feel from the sort of internally, uh, sanctions are those things that are imposed upon us, fines, being thrown in jail, those kinds of things. They mentioned an, an interesting uh, example of an externalized control being gossip, being gossiped about which those of you who grew up in small towns or attend small colleges 
may know this perhaps too well, that people, you don't want to be talked about. And this can function as a way in which you keep people in line. So as a, as a broad characterization, uh, Michael Gonzalez and Camp talk about a range of non-state societies. So uh, the kinds of organization structures that we've talked about, bands, tribes, and chiefdoms, uh, which they refer to basically as uncentralized systems. And in these societies, they tend to prioritize, as they said, and we'll talk about on Monday, uh, lineage or kinship or family kinds of organization. They tend to prioritize internalized controls. The leaders tend to be more informal and may be temporary. So in the case of the uncle, the big man, uh, there were other people who were uh, around who might have been by, who were, who might have been, who were actively vying for that status. And so people can come in and out of leadership according to the needs of the group. And uh, in these societies, they also, uh, it's not simply kinship. There's also groups like age sets, like the people who, who were born in a certain generation or gender. And we saw that uh, back in uh, Laura Bohannon's Shakespeare in the Bush, where uh, she, the, the Tiv argued to her that Hamlet would have no reason to avenge his, his father's death because that should be the role of uh, his father's age mates or the people in that generation. So that's a, those are ways in which uh, some of the societies that are, that are characterized as not having state or state government uh, are organized. One of the things that happens under colonialism is that as colonial authority was imposed, they would often go to a group and say, in that classic movie line, you know, take me to your leader, who's in charge here? And the people there might have taken them to the informal leader at the time, and the colonial people would say, aha, here we have the person who will function as your king or chief or president. And so a lot of times, many of the, the informal relationships which had been established uh, before colonialism were the, under the, the colonial governments were made to be more hierarchical and made to be, or, or they tried to sort of make sure that they had administrators in, in place uh, who are doing their, who are doing their bidding. So in some ways, this transformed the social controls more toward what is known as a state society. So by state societies, anthropologists and others, others, are talking about a central government with the authority to use force. So, uh, let me talk about that a little bit. So what the central government does is it has the authority to use force. It collects taxes or tribute or some form of uh, form of penance, <laughs> accumulates resources in order to do infrastructure, so make things like roads and schools, uh, hospitals, uh, but also, of course, more importantly, to fund the military and to fund the police in order to, uh, to, uh, to run, run the state. Now, they're drawing here don't copy this definition down. It'll be in the it'll, it'll be in the PowerPoint. They're drawing here on a on a very famous definition of the state that comes to us from uh, 
Max Weber back in 1918, who said that the state was the human community that successfully claims the monopoly of the legitimate use of physical force within a given territory. So what Weber was saying is that a state is defined by the, the central government, which has the ability to use force legitimately, or the citizens will feel that, aha, if the, the police come in and do something, that's okay. But I'm not supposed to use force against somebody that's illegitimate. So what states do is they try to pacify or suppress things like raids or feuds. So for example, Anka is actually a great example of this. Uh, actually, Alex, what does Anka do when he's in trouble there? <laughs> what the... Huh? <laughs> well, he's not even able to block the road. Isn't it have that much power? What does he do in the road? <laughs> he sits in the road and, and they, they do stop for him, which is nice of them. And then what does he try to do? Yeah. Do they listen? <laughs> ah, some of them do, right? So the idea here is that, uh, and he tries to tell them that, you know, that they used to fight each other, uh, but they shouldn't anymore, and that the Europeans put an end to that, and that they shouldn't be able to do that. So in the olden days, and you see clips of uh, Anka's father-in-law talking about them fighting each other all the time, there were different raids and feuds between groups. And that was something that happened. Uh, in the film, they say, well, when the Australians pacified the area, because states always like to believe that they're pacifying people, that they're bringing peace into an area. But the thing is, they may, they may suppress to a certain extent because of their coercive force, these raids or feuds, you're not supposed to have those. You're not just supposed to take revenge on somebody if, if they, even if they hurt one of your own. But when it comes to the kinds of things that states make possible, instead of raids and feuds, we have the advent of large scale warfare where different countries are going to war against each other. And this was something we learned back in uh, Augustine Fuente's article when we talked about the emergence of warfare. So sure, there was uh, reciprocal revenge uh, raids and those kinds of things, but it didn't involve the entire population basically going in and trying to conquer territory. And uh, I, in fact, bring that up because uh, anthropologists have often portrayed going to the Papua New Guinea and going into these remote highlands and villages and you see all these things, but this was an area uh, of the world which was subject to one of the most brutal bombing campaigns ever waged in human history during World War II. One of the most grueling uh, campaigns involving the Japanese, the Australians, and and the Americans. Um, so uh, the, the kind of idea that, that there was pacification in this area, so many people uh, died in that, in, in, those, in those struggles, many, many, many more than ever did during the, the pre-colonial raids and feuds. In most state societies, maybe I'll say in all state societies, there are forms of social stratification or layers of, of control uh, where you have upper classes and lower classes or rulers and uh, nobles and peasants. Um, and if you think about uh, how Richard Lee was off in the Kalahari and they were trying to completely level people down, and make sure that nobody had or got big heads and were seen as higher than others. In state societies, uh, you often have these kinds of hierarchies or stratifications. 
There's different forms of stratification which Michael Gonzalez and Camp discuss. One of them is uh, the colonial stratifications when in which you have colonizers, non-indigenous colonizers coming in to uh, impose rules on indigenous colonizers. This often becomes uh, kind of racialized and we talked about how different ideas about race and uh, emerged from the colonial encounter, especially in the Americas, uh, and were used as a justification for that colonization. Uh, we could also think about this in what we just talked about, how uh, under colonization, uh, the uh, the systems of authority were, were more solidified as they tried to uh, make informal leaders into more permanent figures. Michael Gonzalez and Camp discuss some kinds of uh, classic forms of, of stratification. One of them is class stratification, which is uh, social class or uh, based on your wealth and status within a society. This is known as an achieved status because hypothetically you should be able to move up and down the class ladder based on what you do and what you accumulate in your life. And it's often contrasted with the idea of caste or ascribed status, which happens uh, in places where the, the occupation or the place that you were born into, you're not supposed to be able to move from that place. And so it's known as an ascribed status. The most famous example is from uh, South Asia and the Hindu caste system. Some people uh, have thought about whether or not in our own society, we actually have the mobility that we believe we do, or is our society more like, although we don't call it that, a caste society. And so actually there's been a recent book, which is uh, called caste, which reflects on the U.S. system of racial hierarchies and says that, you know, in a lot of ways, this is basically a caste system that you, once you were born into it, it is very difficult to be socially mobile. So it's just something that is uh, it's always worth thinking about because we have certain ideas of social mobility, which are, which we believe in. They, in some ways, people say that the class system in the United States is hegemonic, to use that term from before, because people at the bottom believe that they're going to make it to the top, that they can be a millionaire, that we can all be millionaires. Uh, and, so, uh, and so people don't usually disrupt the system because they believe, they believe in it, even though they might be at the bottom of it. In this section, Michael Gonzalez and Camp also discuss gender stratification and gender inequality. As I've mentioned, we'll be talking more about ideas of gender uh, in, on Monday and Wednesday. But just to put uh, to um, to preview that here, uh, one of the things they say here is that although uh, although the uh, the hegemony of gender inequality or the belief in it uh, is, is seen as natural. This is something that varies across societies. And there was a really interesting thing that they, that they cite is the work of uh, anthropologist Ernestine Friedel, who compared different uh, hunting and gathering societies and she postulated is that in those societies in which women controlled the protein or had access to control of the, the meat in these societies meant that they would have more power in those societies. And what was to extend to our own societies, um, you could put the word protein in quotes as I've done here, what she was arguing is that uh, 
uh, women need power over non-domestic resources, stuff that is outside the home. And to the degree that they are able to control that kind of stuff, uh, they will have uh, a higher status uh, in society. So uh, it's another, it's, a, it's an interesting idea about how, uh, how gender stratification varies across and within uh, different societies. As I said, whenever you think about you know, social class or the hierarchies that we see, um, what's interesting is to think about to what degree is the dominance of one group over another, supported by the people themselves. So ideally, the ruling classes want to have hegemony, right, where people believe in the system, even if they're not benefiting that much from it, or even if they're at the bottom of it. And if you don't have hegemony, if you just have domination, then it, you're vulnerable to revolts and rebellions and those kinds of things that might, uh, that might overthrow the system. So the ideas of persuasion, coercion, domination, hegemony are always uh, important to think about in any sort of stratified state society. Up until now, we've been talking about simply the state. And as we've talked about, a state is a form of centralized government that is getting resources from, from the people, sometimes redistributing those resources in the form of infrastructure, other times, just trying to monopolize the, the violence or the coercive force in a society through the police or the military. But in the last few hundred years, the idea has emerged that states correspond to nations. And this hasn't always been the case. Um, as we see in, in Onga's example, you might say that the state is doesn't really correspond to an identity that people would have as, say, Papua New Guinea. Uh, and in many cases, the state has to be built from different forms of identification. So the historian Benedict Anderson wrote a, a very famous book which talks about states or nation states as imagined communities. And the idea here that he had is that you know, for those of you who grew up in a community, or if you think about the community of, of a small community like Hartwood College, where people are interacting with each other and all know each other, there's that form of community. But when we talk about a nation, we imagine ourselves as in a big community in solidarity with a whole bunch of people that we've never met before. And then we might even do things for even though they don't form part of our everyday lives. So that even people in California might be part of our nation and we might go to war to help the people that if California were attacked, even though we're way over here. One of the best quotes I think about this came from the, uh, a politician who in 1861 was fighting for the unification of an Italian state. And this is not very long ago. This is 150 years ago. Prior to that time, there were all these kind of little principalities and various uh, people who had control over small areas of what is now Italy. And uh, Massimo da Leo, boy, my Italian is not is non-existent. No, I have that a last name like that. His idea was, all right, we now have an Italian state. We now have an Italian government. We've now been able to unify the country. We now must make people into Italians which is to say that before that, people didn't identify 
has necessarily as Italian. So how do you make people who were speaking different languages that weren't Italian and doing all their little things? How do you make how do you make Italians? Yeah. Get them some kind of common ground. So yeah, you try to impress upon them that they all come from a similar place. Maybe write a little bit of a history that you know gives them a commonality. Where might you do this? What's a good place to learn all this stuff? The school system, right? And so you go and you make them speak one language and you hit them if they speak a different language. So what happened to my grandfather? And you, uh, you know, you you try and form people into a, a, the identity of being an Italian citizen. Even in today's world, the differences between being in the north and being in the south of Italy or or is a is a divide. Uh, one of the things they do, though, is ha or has has been to have compulsory military service. In which people from you put people from the south and you mix them up with people from the north and then you put them in a different place and you give them that sense of national identity. A lot of people think that the national US or national American identity really didn't emerge until after World War II when we put people together uh, in military units and sent them all over the place uh, to fight together uh, as a as a country. So the implications, the political implications of this, uh, when we look back upon uh, the different forms of political organization that anthropologists have discovered, is that people have actually done all kinds of different things, different experiments, you might say, in organizing their society and in uh, in thinking about who should have leadership and what what authority and power and prestige might constitute. In the last couple hundred years, partly because of colonialism, partly because of the kinds of political movements uh, that emerged uh, in the Americas and in and really now all over the place, you're the hegemonic idea, the idea that has been uh, mostly accepted around the world is that everyone should belong to a nation state and that a nation state has one people on one land that all speak one language. But this is a relatively recent idea in human history and it's not the way that people organized uh, you might say traditionally or before that. And so there's been over the years a, a populations that are multilingual or speak different languages or don't fit into the model get persecuted or in, in the most terrible cases forms of, of genocide against people who who are not we're seen as not part of the nation. It's also been extremely limiting on what we know as one of the things that people have done since the beginning of being people is migrate and be mobile. And certainly when you're trying to draw boundaries and walls and cut people off from being able to move to different places, it becomes more difficult for those uh, populations um, to, to do what we have been doing as human beings. And of course, as we talked about, uh, we imported this idea that when you are fighting for your country, that's equivalent to fighting for your community or fighting for your family, um, which has some pretty huge, which is, has led us to some very enormous conflicts uh, 
uh, across our across the globe, right? So 